next story, The Saints in Paradise, is uh, has quite an interesting story behind the story, actually, because uh, it was originally written as an animated movie script for Carefree Cartoons, which are no longer exist. Well, it does exist now on YouTube on our channel, but um, that was way back in the 50s when myself and my friends Derek Soul and Cyril Smith, Dell and Cy, started up our own cartoon studios in Palmerston Road, Walthamstow, and we were going to produce cartoons, and this was going to be our first one. We did the storyboard and everything, I wrote the script, and um, sadly, our cameraman, uh, Derek, uh, died at a woefully young age, and um, so he was the technical man, and that uh, killed the whole idea. I mean, we got to know people like Bob Godfrey and Alison Batchel and people like that in the meantime, but the story never will, you know, they say old stories never die, and this story never did because it just got rewritten <laughs> as a book, and here it is, The Saints in Paradise. So here we go. Two mice did the Charleston, and a cockroach sang a song as he wallowed in a pool of spilled beer. A moth danced merrily in the air, caught in a stream of cigarette smoke. Don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> it's disgusting. And smoking is a disgusting habit. But who could wonder at this merry scene? The music was irresistible, even to those with no sense of rhythm at all. And it didn't matter whether you did the Charleston, the twist, rock and roll, or any other type of dance. As long as you enjoyed yourself, that was all that mattered. In the hall, packed with madly reeling dancers, it was difficult to say whether one couple danced exceptionally well, or another really badly. Uh, it didn't really matter, and even though the couple belonged to each other, you couldn't tell really, because nobody really cared. The hazy atmosphere seemed electrified by the rocking music. This came from the opposite end of the hall, snaking its way through the place like some drunken serpent. It seemed to be gulping down the dancers, only to be attacked by a violent dose of indigestion as the dancers seemed to be caught up in utter frenzy, knocking over tables on which rested bottles of liquor glasses and the elbows of tired but happy specimens of humanity. The drummer, wearing sweat pouring from his bow like rain from a cloud, pounded his kit like never before. Cigarettes were lit and snubbed out. Glasses were filled and emptied, all in the time to the music. Mad, tantalising, almost devilish music that made the soberest feet tap of the not-so-sober ones twist in utter frenzy upon the dance floor. After all, why should the devil have all the best music? It was such, much the same scene as any other night, really, at this particular club. Many, though, were not the usual patrons. This was a very special occasion, the club's 21st anniversary. To mark the occasion, the proprietor, Nye T. Lee, had booked the top band of the time, the Saints. The Saints comprised of Del Liverance on lead guitar, Des Demona on banjo, Duke Street on electric double bass, Cy Anoid on saxophone, George King on keyboards, and Spike DeLemon on drums and percussion. He had also invited along several guest celebrities. There was Rock Turtle, the famous American film star, together with the leading lady of his new film, Only the Rich Die Young, the beautiful Flame Kindle. Cynthia Barclay Smythe, the socialite, was there with her escort, and also that fabulous multi-millionaire Elfie Appetite, Lord of Bedside Manor, who had a special interest in the band. He had actually bought the rights to one of the band's songs when they were still a struggling local group. Once they became famous, of course, he'd sold the songs 
for vast profit that actually paid for his home, Bedside Manor. But that's another story which you may have read already. If you haven't, why not? You can imagine then there were a lot of talent and an awful lot of money circulating in the Striped Dragon Club that night. Suddenly, the joyous atmosphere was broken. The door flew open, and there, standing menacingly in the doorway, were four men of various shapes and sizes. They were all wearing raincoats and trilby hats. Each of their faces was covered with a mask. And this was before Covid. <laughs> they were gangsters, in fact. This was the area known as Solo, in the city of Tucked Wells, at the time when gangsters were as common as tiddlers in a stream and just as difficult to catch. The band stopped. The dancing stopped. The mice and the cockroach stopped. The moth stopped in mid-air, only to plop into a pool of spilled beer. Almost at once, there was a mad rush, and every available table was acting as a shelter to the quaking dancers. The mice and the cockroach had found little holes in which to hide, which the moth had crawled out of the pool of beer and was staggering about trying to dry himself off. The reason for this pandemonium was clear. Here before them stood the notorious lofty legged gang, feared throughout the city of Lexicon and every other major city throughout the country of Bedside. For the band, it was rather more difficult to conceal themselves. They did their best, but however, you know, in the circumstances, he saw the saxophonist climbed into his baritone sax. George, the keyboard player, climbed into the piano and duped the bassist into the double bass. Spike the drummer made himself as comfortable as he could inside the bass drum. The other members of this rather unique band could only quake even more with a mass of the humanity under the tables. Have you ever tried hiding in an electric guitar or a banjo? Not easy, you know. I say the Saints were a unique band, and indeed they were. They were out to create a new sound. Never before had there been a band that had blended the sound of traditional jazz so well with the sound of hard rock. Now, however, not only was the band unique, it was in a dire situation. This was the first hold-up in the Stripe Dragon Club since it had opened 25 years ago. Lofty Leggett and company were true underworld cronies. They had merged from an under, underground sewer up a manhole cover in Solo Square and they held up the girl in the box office. They let her down eventually after she complained that she was scared of heights. Anyway, by this time they were neatly gagged, she was neatly gagged and tied up in her little office. Her boyfriend had phoned while this was going on, but this didn't disturb the call, Mr Leggett. He simply picked up the phone and told the boyfriend, quite truthfully, that she was tied up for the moment. The caller rang off, completely unaware of the drama that was unfolding just a few inches from his ear hole. So here they were, the notorious Lefty Laggett gang, striking terror into the good patrons of the Striped Dragon Club. After their dirty work was done, they would return from whence they came, the manhole, and back to the underworld. Two of the men brandished revolvers and would twirl them around their middle finger as though we were some heroes in a western movie. Another taller man helped himself to a drink which had been left untouched on one of the tables. He poured it down his throat in one sweep. Lofty Leggett himself started the proceedings. Lofty was a very short man, hence the joke nickname of Lofty. He had a weird sense of humour. He wore an outsized hat and a raincoat with a collar up, but he was a real mean dude. His right-hand man, however, was a very large and menacing man. 
very dim-witted, but big and tough. He was ideally suited to the rough stuff. Known as Cutnail Harry, after the implement of that name, he was really as tough as nails, but nowhere near as sharp. OK, Lofty addressed his captive audience as he pulled a fat cigar from the breast pocket. An equally big fat man. Nobody gets hurt if you play it my way. Get it? The owner of the cigar tried to process, but he changed his mind when he found himself staring down the barrel of a revolver. Lofty proceeded to light the cigar with his lighter, which had been procured in the same manner. Now at this point, you may well ask how Lofty came to smoke a cigar with a mask on. Well, of course, the fact is the mask didn't have a cigar. Lofty did, however, although that was a waste of time since he was so well known. So in answer to your question, Clever Dick, Lofty's mask had a little mouth hole in it. Not a mouse hole, a mouth hole. This enabled him to drink, eat, talk and do all sorts of other things that you do with your mouth, including smoking other people's cigars. I don't ask much, folks, Lofty continued. Just the odd gold watch, silver lighter, a few poil necklaces, that's all. Oh yeah, and some dough. You see, I kind of like dough. It and me gets along really well together. Cough up chickens and I'll be real grateful. You may be wondering at this point what a poil necklace is. Well, let me explain. To anyone else, a poil necklace would be called a pearl necklace. Lofty had been raised on old American gangster movies. His parents had used the TV as a babysitter, which is not recommended to would-be parents, quite honestly. That is to say, they hadn't actually sat the TV on the infant Lofty. They used to sit him firmly secured to a high chair in front of it. This led him to picking up all sorts of bad grammar. Pearls became poils. Money became dough. I only mentioned this in case you thought that Lofty was a master baker, but he wasn't. He was a master criminal. Everyone was too willing to play the game, so what could they do to get rid of these undesirable characters? Lady Frobisher's poils, I mean pearls, were thrown into the centre of the hall. After all, they were heavily insured anyway. Elfie Appetite's gold watch came their way, and so did Rock Turtle's well-filled wallet. Even Flame, Flame Kindle's diamond-studded suspender belt was offered. Lofty held this up to his waist, walked up and down, swaying his hips in the manner of a model. This proved to be a great source of amusement to his fellow gangsters. Just then a young man crawled out from beneath the table. He was a weedy specimen of mankind, wearing pince-nez glasses at the end of his long, bony nose. Every time he spoke, unable to pronounce his R's properly, his nose twitched and his glasses fell off. Never fear, Cynthia, darling, he cried. He struck a heroic pose, clutching at his heart with one hand and putting the back of the other hand to his forehead. I will save you, he said as he made a brave gesture in the air. One of the gangsters made an equally impressive gesture of a different kind, but the less about that the better. The young man, however, continued, determined to say his piece. I'll protect you from these waters, he said as he picked up his glasses. A voice from beneath the table answered him. There, there, Sydney, my true love, Cynthia pleaded with him. You cannot curb the way of fate. Lofty was getting a trifle restless by now. He pulled a small bomb from his raincoat just to liven up the proceedings, you understand. OK, he told Sydney. Be a hero. Here, catch this. With that, he hurled the bomb at the little chap. Sidney suddenly lost his hero look 
as the blood drained from his face. He ducked just in time for the missile to go whistling over his head. <whistles> All eyes were on the bomb as he travelled past his target and on to destinations unknown. There was a general scramble as everyone tried to get further under the tables. Tables were upturned as others within the line of fire tried to run from them. Fingers were trodden upon. Glasses smashed. In fact, it was even worse than the cut final at Wembley. Suddenly, there was a trivial explosion. This immediately told everyone except Sydney that the bomb had landed. Everyone was coughing now as the smoke mingled with that of cigarettes and fine cigars deadly mixture, was choking them. Eyes were streaming and people were bumping into each other. In fact, there was General Chaos who was there together with his wife, Mrs Chaos. Eventually, however, things quietened down a bit. The smoke cleared and it was time to assess the damage. Sydney was quite all right, so was Sydney. The people on the next table, or rather under it, were okay too. They all wondered, and I'll bet you're wondering too, unless you've read this book before, and if you have, why well, are you reading it again? Get a new one. What had happened to the bomb? By this time, Lofty and his mates had disappeared, of course, together with the loot to boot, despite Sydney's gallant efforts. Nevertheless, Sydney was getting more than his fair share of attention from adoring young females. <laughs> <laughs> much to the annoyance of Cynthia. The hero worshipping was broken up, however, when a voice came from across the other side of the hall. The band! General Chaos exclaimed. It's hit the band! Everybody looked towards the general to discover that he was indeed quite correct. The bomb had landed on the bandstand. The saints had been blown from here to kingdom come. Saints, we are the saints in paradise, in paradise, sitting on a cloud to be precise, to be precise. playing our funky music to the angels up above, spreading happiness and peace and love. At this point, there's an author's note by the author. It should be made clear at this point that all the characters in this story are fictitious, however familiar they may seem to any living person. The exceptions to this are for the two mice, the cockroach, the moth, from whom we received written permission before the book was published. I would also like to point out that the saints are the heroes of this story, so now they've been blown up, why should the end, shouldn't it be the end of the story? Ah, read on. Two mice did the Charleston and a cockroach sang a song as the band played jazz rock music all night long. Everyone was happy, nothing could go wrong till a bunch of nasty gangsters threw a bomb. We are the saints. We are the saints.